Animal Farm by George Orwell Chapter 1 Mr. Jones of the Manor Farm had logged the hen houses for the night, but was too drunk to remember to shut the pop holes. With a ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boot at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out, there was a staring and a fluttering all through the farm buildings. What had gone round during the day that Old Major, the prize middle boar, had had a strange dream on the previous night and wished to communicate it to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big van as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. Old Major, so he was always called, though the name and the way she had been exhibited was Wellington Beauty, was so highly regarded on the farm that everyone was quite ready to lose an hour's sleep in order to hear what he had to say. At one end of the big barn, on a sort of raised platform, Major was already esconed on his bed of straw under a lantern which hung from a beam. He was 12 years old and had lately grown rather stout, but he was still a majestic looking pig. With a wise and benevolent appearance, in spite of the fact that his stashes had been cut. Before long, the other animals began to arrive and make themselves comfortable after their different fashion. First came the three dogs, Bluebell, Jesse, and Pincher, and then the pigs, who settled down in the straw immediately in front of the platform. The hens perched themselves on the wind seals, the pigeons fluttered up to the rafters, the sheep and cows lay down behind the pigs and began to chew the cart. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hooves with great care, lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Clover was a stout motherly mare approaching middle life, who had never quite got her figure back after her four foals. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly 18 hands high, and as strong as any two ordinary horses put together. A white strip down his nose gave him a somewhat stupid appearance, and in fact, he was not of first-rate intelligence, but he was universally respected for his steadiness of character and tremendous powers of work. After the horses came Muriel, the white goat, and Benjamin, the donkey. Benjamin was the oldest animal on the farm and the worst tempered. He seldom talk, and when he did, it was usually to make some cynical remarks. For instance, he would say that God had given him a tail to keep the flies off, but that he would sooner have had no tail and no flies. Alone among the animals on the farm, he never laughed. If asked why, he would say that he saw nothing to laugh at. Nevertheless, without openly admitting it, he was devoted to Boxer. The two of them usually spend their Sundays together in the small padlock beyond the orchard, grazing side by side and never speaking. The two horses had just lain down with a brood of ducklings, which had lost their mother, filled into the barn, chipping feebly and wandering from side to side to find some place where they could not be trolled on. Clover made a sort of wall around them with her great foreleg and the ducklings rested down inside it and promptly fell asleep. At the last moment, Molly, the foolish pretty white mare who drew Mr. Jones's trap, came mincing densely in, chewing at a lump of sugar. She took a place in front and began flirting with her white mane, hoping to draw attention to the red ribbons it was planted with. Last of all came the cat, who looked round as usual for the warmest place, and finally squeezed herself in between Boxer and Clover. There she paired contentedly 
throughout Major's speech without listening to a word of what he was saying. All the animals were now present, except Moses, the tame raven, who slept on the perch behind the back door. When Major saw that they had all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and began. Comrades, you have heard already about a strange dream that I had last night, but I will come to the dream later. I have something else to say first. I do not think, comrades, that I shall be with you for many months longer, and before I die, I feel it is my duty to pass on to you such wisdom I have acquired. I have had a long life. I have had much time for thought as I lay alone in my stall, and I think I may say that I understand the nature of life on this earth as well as any animal now living. It is about this that I wish to speak to you. Now, comrades, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it, our lives are miserable, laborious, and short. We are born, we are given just so much food as we keep the breath in our bodies, and those of us who are capable of it are forced to work the last atom of our strength. And the very instant our usefulness had come to an end, we are slaughtered with hideous cruelty. No animal in England knows the meaning of happiness or leisure after he is a year old. No animal in England is free. The life of an animal is misery and slavery. This is the plain truth. But is this simply part of the order of nature? Is it because this land of ours is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life? To those who dwell upon it, no comrades, a thousand times no. The soil of England is fertile, its climate is good. It is capable of affording food in abundance to an enormously greater number of animals than now inhabit it. This single farm of ours will support a dozen horses, twenty cows, hundreds of sheep, and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of the produce of our labor is stolen from us by human beings. Their comrades is the answer to all our problems. It is summed up in a single word, man. Man is the only real enemy we have. Remove man from the scene. And the root cause of hunger and overwork is abolished forever. Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow. He cannot run fast enough to catch rabbits. Yet, he is lord of all the animals. He sends them to work. He gives them back a bare minimum. That will prevent them from starving. And the rest he keeps for himself. Our labor tills the soil. Our dung fertilizes it. And yet, there is not one of us that owns more than his bare skin. You cows that I see before me, how many thousands of gallons of milk have you given during the last year? And what has happened to that milk? We should have been breeding up steady cows. Every drop of it has gone down the throats of our enemies. And you hens, how many eggs have you laid in this last year? And how many of those eggs have ever hatched into chickens? The rest have all gone to the market to bring in money for Jones and his men. And you clover, where are those four foes you bore? Who should have been the support and the pleasure of your old age? Each was sold a year old, and you will never see them again. In return for your four confinement and all your labor in the field, what have you had except your bare rations and a store? And even the miserable lives we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. For myself, I do not grumble, for I am one of the lucky ones. I am 12 years old. And I have had over 400 children. 
Such is the natural life of a pig. But no animal escapes a cruel knife in the end. You young pokers who are sitting in front of me, every one of you will scream your lives out at a block within a year. To that horror, we all must come. Cows, pigs, hens, sheep, everyone, even the horses and the dogs have no better fate. You boxer, the very day those great muzzles of yours lose their power, Jones will sell you to the knacker, who will cut your throat and boil you down the fox hounds. As for the dogs, when they grow old and toothless, Jones tie a brick round their necks and throws them to the nearest pond. Is it not crystal clear, then comrades, that all the evil of this life of ours spring from the tyranny of human being? Only get rid of man, and the produce of our labor would be our own. Almost overnight, we could become rich and free. What then must we do? Why work night and day, body and soul, for the overthrow of human race? That is my message to you, comrades. Rebellion. I do not know when the rebellion will come. It might be in a week or in a hundred years. But I know, as surely as I see the straw beneath my feet, that sooner or later, justice will be done. Fix your eyes on that, comrades, throughout the short remainders of your lives. And above all, pass on this message of mine to those who come after you, so that future generations shall carry on the struggle until it is victorious. And remember, comrades, your resolution must never falter. No argument must lead you astray. Never listen when they tell you that man and the animals have a common interest. That the prosperity of one is the prosperity of the others. It is all lies. Man serves the interest of no creature except himself. And among us animals, let there be perfect unity, perfect comradeship in the struggle. All men are enemies. All animals are comrades. At this moment, there was a tremendous uproar. While Major was speaking, four large rats had crept out of their holes and were sitting in their hindquarters, listening to him. The dogs had suddenly caught sight of them. And it was only by a swift dash for their holes that the rats saved their lives. Major raised his trousers for silence. Comrades, he said, here is a point that must be settled. The wild creatures, such as rats and rabbits, are they our friends or our enemies? Let us put it to the vote. I propose this question to the meeting. Are rat comrades? The vote was taken at once, and it was agreed by an overwhelming majority that rats were comrades. There were only four dissentients, the three dogs and the cat, who was afterwards discovered to have voted on both sides. Major continued, I have little more to say. I merely repeat, remember always, your duty of enmity towards man and all his ways. Whatever goes up two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when we have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house, or sleep in a bed, or wear clothes, or drink alcohol, or smoke tobacco, or touch money, or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. Weak or small, clever or simple, we are all brothers. No animal must ever kill any other animal. All animals are equal. And now, comrades, 
I will tell you about my dream of last night. I cannot describe that dream to you. It was a dream of the years, as it was when man was vanished. But it reminded me of something that I had long forgotten. Many years ago, when I was a little pig, my mother and other souls used to sing an old song of which they had knew only the tune and the first three words. I had known that tune in my infancy, but it had long since passed out of my mind. Last night, however, it came to me in my dream, and what is more, the words of the song also came back. Words, I am certain, which were sung by the animals of long ago and have been lost to memory for generations. I will sing you that song now, comrade. I am old and my voice is hoarse, but when I have taught you the tune, you can sing it better for yourselves. It is called Beast of England. Old Major cleared his throat and began to sing. As he said, his voice was hoarse, but he sang well enough, and it was a stirring tune. Something between Clementine and La Cucuraca. The words ran, Beast of England, Beast of Ireland, Beast of every land and clime, Hacking of my joyful tidings of the golden future time. Soon or late, the day is coming. Tyrant's man shall be overthrown. And the fruitful fields of England shall be trolled by beasts alone. Rings shall vanish from their noses and the harness from their back. Bates and spur shall rust forever. Cruel whips no more shall crack. Riches more than mine can picture. Wheat and barley, oats and ley, clover, beans, and mangel wazzle shall be ours that day. Bright will shine the fields of England. Purer as waters be, sweeter, yet shall blow its breezes on the day that set us free. For that day, all must labor. Though we die before it break, cows and horses, geese and turkeys, all must toil for freedom's sake. Beast of England, beast of Ireland, beast of every land and clime, hacking well and spread my tidings of the golden future time. The singing of this song threw the animals into the wildest excitement. Almost before Major had reached the end, they had begun singing it for themselves. Even the stupidest of them had already picked up the tune and a few of the words. And for the clever ones, such as the pigs and dogs, they had the entire song by heart within a few minutes. And then, after a few preliminary tries, the whole farm burst out into Beast of England in tremendous unison. The cows lowered it, the dogs whined it, the sheep bleated it, the horses whined it, the ducks quacked it. They were so delighted with the song that they sang it right through five times in succession and might have continued singing it all night if they had not been interrupted. Unfortunately, the uproar awoke Mr. Jones, who sprang out of bed, making sure there was a fox in the yard. He seized the gun, which always sit in the corner of his bedroom, and let fly a charge of six shots into the darkness. The pillars buried themselves in the walls of the barn, and the meeting broke up hurriedly. Everyone fled into his own sleeping place. The birds jumped into their perches. The animals settled down in the straw, and the whole farm was asleep in a moment.